بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وتابعنا لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وعلينا معهم وفيهم برحمتك يا أرحم الرحيمين اللهم عنا على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك O oh Allah, aid us in remembering you, thanking you and worshiping you well. We ask you that by your mercy, and you're the most merciful of the merciful. Ya Arham ar Ya Arham ar Ya Arham ar Continuing these lessons in the beginning of guidance, Bidayat wal Hidayah of Imam Hujjat al Islam al Ghazali, Rahimahullah. In this session, we will talk about etiquette of the ritual prayer, and we'll combine some other. Um, points from the section on prayer in general. The learned say about this book, someone who wants guidance, let him act on the beginning. Man arad al-hidayah fa'alayhi fal-ya'mal bima fil-bidayah. And uh, in this section he talks about uh, etiquettes of the most important of our bodily works, which is the prayer. The most important of the bodily works of the human being are the prayer. If that person's uh, prayer is good, his whole Islam will be good. And he'll be enabled to enter paradise. And if you want to measure uh, your Islam, you can look at your state with the prayer. They mention about this text, and alhamdulillah, Sheikh Amin got the um, fortune of transmitting that portion, that the section on uh, preparing to stand before Allah, which talks about etiquettes of uh, ablution, that the secret of the text is actually there. And um, the key to prayer, the Prophet ﷺ said, Miftah as salah at tuhur. The key to prayer is purification. So we're going to talk a little bit about the prayer specifically, but Al Imam Al Ghazali reminds us that when we prepare ourselves for salah, we should not be negligent of the meanings of the conditions of salah. So uh, salah, like other works, has preconditions as well as obligations that are performed as part of the work. So from the pre -pre preconditions is physical and ritual purity, right? That your body be pure and clean and that you make ablution or do ghusl if you have to. Facing the qibla, the entrance of the time, knowledge of the entrance of the time and covering uh, one's nakedness. So each of these has meanings. Each of these has meanings. So from the meanings of the clothing that we adorn before we make the prayer, and there is a reference to our covering ourselves in the Q&A session, from the meanings of that is our being shy before Allah from our faults. Right? We cover areas of our body that we are shy to expose to the creation. So there's a meaning of humility and shyness and certain things that you should be ashamed to, ashamed to expose. And with respect to Allah, we know that we're entirely exposed to Him, subhanahu. So um, that shyness uh, should translate into um, seeking His forgiveness and knowing that only His forgiveness will cover um, our sins and our faults. Right? And uh, that's a meaning of uh, forgiveness. Al maghfirah is a satr. It means to conceal, to cover um, the faults. A meaning of facing the qibla is that one turns away from everything other than the qibla. And um, that applies with respect to um, our turning to Allah, that we only turn to Allah if we've turned away from everything other than Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the prayer time enters and the adhan is called, that's reminiscent of our being summoned on Yom Al Qiyamah. And they mentioned that um, the pace at which you respond to the adhan is similar to the pace at which you will respond on Yom Al Qiyamah. Those that were more quick in this world in response to the call to prayer are more quick on Yom Al Qiyamah in their response uh, to being summoned. And understand that the adhan is a summons. Uh, to an audience in which we will commune with the divine. So you're being invited and beckoned to the presence of God himself. So we should look in our heart uh, for an enthusiasm for that meeting and that opportunity. A meaning of um, 
purifying ourselves is purifying ourselves from sin. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned this specifically in hadith that when one purifies oneself for wudu, uh, for prayer and does so well by performing ablution, one's sins uh, fall from one, um, even to the extent that they come from beneath one's fingernails. And we should understand that purification is of degrees, right? Purification is of degrees. And um, the highest of those degrees is that the heart be pure from attachment to everything other than Allah. But that begins with um, outward degrees, and the, the furthest of those is purifying one's clothing, right? So the clothes must be pure from um, types of uh, filth and impure substance, which would render the, the prayer invalid. Um, one's body must also be pure. That's why we do istinja. Uh, and then one perform ablution, and these are layers, uh, but the deeper layers are the purification of the heart from sin, um, or the purification of the body from sin, of the heart from poor character, and ultimately the soul from uh, attachment to everything other than Allah. So one should be aware of those and understand that there's deep meanings in these um, relatively simple and in, to some degree habitual actions that we perform. But we should call to heart the meanings behind these actions when we're performing them. La ilaha illallah. And then one of the questions that is invariably asked when we talk about prayer, or just like if you just do an open Q&A, or specifically if we talk about prayer, is how do I have more presence? How can I be more present in the salah? And one of the strongest means to increasing our concentration, our presence in salah and our awareness of what we're doing is to be present while we're performing ablution. Right, so presence in ablution is that you understand it's an act of worship, um, that you are present with Allah, what does that mean? In simple terms, you're thinking about Allah. You're thinking about Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, not thinking about DTE bill or something. Wow, this is hot water, my DTE bill is going to be real high. No, thinking about Allah while you're um, worshiping Him with the act of ablution, then also that you remember Him. And in this text, uh, the list of du'as, of invocations He gives for ablution, if you have somewhere where you can make wudu outside of a bathroom, it's helpful, you know, photocopy it and put those there and read them while you're making ablution. If not all of them, at least some of them, so that you can become uh, aware of those. La ilaha illallah. So all of that's just preparing. All of that is just preparing. And then we want to, um, we're going to give you some page numbers. Inshallah, much of the section on prayer will touch on it. Um, so on page 38, he gives us a reminder. On page 38, the imam gives us a reminder. And alhamdulillah, inshallah, uh, many of us, we saw you there, and we hope everyone was there. Uh, we acted on this um, reminder. So the Imam al-Ghazali, he reminds, and this is with the dawn prayer, but it applies to all of them, do not fail to pray with the congregation. Do not fail to pray with the congregation, especially the morning prayer. The Prophet ﷺ said, if someone prays Isha in congregation, it is as though he stood half of the night. And if he follows that with the dawn prayer, the Fajr prayer in congregation, it is as though he prayed the whole night. And Muslim narrated that. So when you pray Isha after having prayed, or when you pray Fajr after having prayed Isha in congregation, you're like someone who stood all night in prayer, according to the truthful statement of the Prophet ﷺ. You're also someone who's doing the actions of believers and not doing the actions of hypocrites. Because the Prophet ﷺ taught us the most severe prayer for the hypocrites. Our prayers are the Isha prayer and the dawn prayer. La ilaha illallah. Imam al-Ghazali continues, A prayer in congregation is 27 times better, or 27 degrees better, literally in the hadith, than a prayer alone. Salah to jama'ah. تَفْضُلُ صَلَاةُ الْفَذِّ بِسَبْعٍ وَعِشْرِينَ دَرَجًا That's a sahih hadith narrated by the Prophet ﷺ. So he reminds uh, the person for whom he wrote um, this treatise. And he said, If you are negligent of such a profitable act, if you, seeker of knowledge, who sought my advice about learning knowledge, are negligent of such a profitable act, then what benefit is there for you in the pursuit of knowledge? Right? So why bother studying knowledge if you don't even bother with uh, something 
in which there is this immense reward, or something for which there, this, there is this immense reward. And he said, after all, the fruit of knowledge is acting upon it. So as we mentioned, we're here, we're trying to learn, inshallah. We came to learn from Sheikh Yahya and Sheikh Amin and Sadat Taysir and each other. We're trying to learn. So if we're here to learn, Yani, what's the benefit? And we're trying to do something in which there's uh, some, that brings us nearer to Allah. And then we neglect something that has immense profit like this. And we neglect something that the knowledge itself calls us to. That is required as part of the dictates of the Shahada Tam. So as we mentioned, we're studying these session, in these sessions and we're studying from a book, but we want to spend uh, these hours and these remaining prayers between now and Dhuhr tomorrow, at least, or Asr, living this book. Living the verses that are behind this book and the hadith are behind it. And if we do that, we're benefiting. Um, and that's the benefit of knowledge is that you act upon it. The benefit of knowledge is that you act upon it. La ilaha illallah, when we are studying, numerous times our shuyukh would remind us, they would say, if you see a seeker of knowledge who is not avid, not just about congregational prayer, he's not avid about catching the opening Allahu Akbar, meaning the first Allahu Akbar, when the Imam says Allahu Akbar, you say Allahu Akbar right after him. If you see a seeker of knowledge who's not uh, avid, he's not keen to catch the opening Allahu Akbar with the Imam, then... Uh, wipe your hands of him, or literally in Arabic, dust your hands of him. Meaning that, yani, what's the benefit of him seeking knowledge and he's not interested in, in catching the opening Allahu Akbar? She's not interested in catching the opening Allahu Akbar. This most important of their deeds, this intimate meaning and communion with the divine that we have an opportunity to learn from him, his book directly, and speak to him. We just prayed a prayer. All of us were speaking to Allah in the prayer. Allah was responding to us in the prayer. We spoke to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, during the prayer. Allah, resp uh, the Prophet Allah enabled Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to respond to us in the prayer. And we should be aware of that when we're performing that. And Allah give us, uh, give us to do that, inshaAllah ta'ala. They would also say that if you see a seek of, of knowledge who does not pray by night, um, then, uh, or excuse me, someone who is not called a seeker of knowledge who does not get up in the night and pray. So we're seeking knowledge, inshallah. We get up in the night and pray tonight, inshallah, if not every night. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So that's one of the reminders that um, prayer, prayer is performed in congregation. Prayer is performed in congregation. It is not ever transmitted from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he prayed one of the prescribed prayers alone. In all of his years that the prayer was established, we don't have one hadith that said Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa prayed this prayer alone. We have hadith where the Prophet ﷺ had to be carried between two men to come pray in congregation. Or hadith where the Prophet ﷺ numerous times did ghusl to prepare to go out to the, to the congregational prayer. Or prayer, hadith where the Prophet ﷺ, he sat uh, and prayed in congregation because he couldn't stand and was um, leading Sayyidina Abu Bakr who was standing and the people were following him. But we don't have any hadith where Prophet Muhammad ﷺ did not pray in congregation. That is from his sunnah. Um, that is one of the pillars of trying to grow spiritually is that the prayer be the most important of your regular devotional works and that means not just uh, prayer itself but specifically the prescribed prayer performed in congregation la ilaha illallah and then we're going to jump to page 58 and you can just note these if you're not uh, if you do not have the text though we would advise people to acquire that and in um, this section Al-Imam Al-Ghazali, um, he reminds us, he reminds us to, of how we should prepare for the remaining five daily prayers, right? He talked about the dawn prayer in the morning, and then here he talks about the remaining of the five daily prayers. And we should perform each of these with excellence, and we're advising all of us, inshallah, through this intensive specifically, but through our lifespan in general, to apply the advice that he gives you in this section. And then on page 60, he gives one of the gems of this text. And he says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And he's speaking about the dhuhr time. And we ask Allah to enable us to act upon this advice of the great imam. He says, then until Asr prayer, meaning after you've prayed Dhuhr prayer, O seeker of Allah, 
O seeker of sacred knowledge, O you who is taking the beginning of guidance and applying that as a test to his or her soul to see if we're someone who's suitable for this high pursuit to which he's calling us, then until the Asr prayer, do not occupy yourself with anything other than learning useful knowledge. Alhamdulillah, inshallah, we're learning useful knowledge. Helping the Muslims, inshallah, we'll all lend some help to the believers. The, uh, brothers and sisters that are helping with AV or registration or helping the children or those who are working in the soup kitchen, all of them are performing and acting upon this advice. And also if they do so with the intention of assisting us, they're getting the same reward as we're getting. And maybe uh, they're getting a double because they're getting the reward of the works that they did as well. Reciting the Quran or striving to earn your living by which you support your religious life. And this goes back to a principle that he mentioned um, earlier in the text, that basically we have to take advantage of our time. And from the beginning of the day until the end of the day, remain in a state of vigilance about drawing nearer to Allah and remain aware that Allah is vigilantly observant of us. So that we use our time throughout the day in something that is of benefit. That might be a ritual activity or that might be a mundane action or seemingly mundane action such as learning, earning our livelihood. And you know, this is Saturday, Sunday. Many of us Monday morning, some of us tomorrow or some of us today are going to go to our jobs. Excellent. Go to, our, go to work, but do so with a good intention and do so following the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then when you're earning your living to support your worship of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, that earning is also a devotional work. But if we just do so heedlessly, we do so in order to acquire things through which we'll boast before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. We do so, God forbid, in a way that is impermissible or to inquire, acquire impermissible things, things that are forbidden. Then it's, it's not a devotional work. It's a work that brings us farther from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, how did we make it something that brought us near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala versus something that did uh, brought us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? By following the command of Allah in what we do. We don't do it in a forbidden way. We do it in a way that is permissible and by having a good intention. By having a good intention. And he alludes to that by saying, by which you support your religious life, right? You need, you need a roof over your head in order to maintain your health and shelter your family and have a place to pray and have a place to recite the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the first things the Prophet sallallahu did when he came to Medina is he established his masjid and he established his quarters. You need a quarters. A believer needs that. You need food to feed your family. All of those are good works. However, just make an intention in doing those works. And then uh, that becomes a, a work through which we draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says, Before Asr, pray four rakahs, which are emphasized sunnas. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, May Allah have mercy on the slave who prays for rakahs before Asr. Abu Dawood mentioned that or transmitted that. And then he says, make an effort to be the beneficiary of the Prophet's supplication, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anytime you have a hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, may Allah have mercy on someone who does that, if you act on hadith, the Prophet is praying for you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So one of us, again, and the, the Imam, he's given us keys to success, keys to Jannah. So someone stands up after the dawn of Asr, says, um, I learned this hadith, I'm going to pray for rakahs. That person is included in the dua of Nabi Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa that is answered. After Asr, do not engage in anything except the same as what was mentioned earlier. And then he says, your time should not be without any structure, right? You should always have an agenda. The believer always has an agenda. They structure their time. They structure their day and they structure their night. Such that you occupy yourself arbitrarily. So, meaning don't leave it without structure so that you occupy yourself arbitrarily with whatever comes along. Rather, you must take account of yourself and order your worship through the day and night. And ordering your worship also this means based on what he said in other places in the book, organize your mundane activities for the sake of your worship and for the sake of Allah. Assigning to each period of time an activity that must not be neglected, nor replaced by another activity. By this ordering of time, the blessing in time will show itself. Right? So there can be a barakah in your lifespan. Some people have short lifespans that are full of barakah. 
Imam al Nawawi, he lived for 30 some years. And were you to compile um, all of the works that he authored, he would have had to write like 20 pages a day from the day he was born until the day he died. Right? And obviously he wasn't writing in his cradle. He was writing later. But that was how he used his time. It was full of blessing. How do you attain a blessing in time? By organizing your time through the day and night. A person who leaves himself without a plan, as animals do, not knowing what he is to do at any given moment, will spend most of his time fruitlessly. Your time is your life, and your life is your capital. Your time. You have a limited number of breaths, a limited number of seconds that you will be on this earth uh, as a, an accountable person. Right? That time, that lifespan of yours, that is your capital. That is like you know, a merchant, uh, someone in business, that is your capital. When you're losing your time, you're like going into, into the red. You're losing your capital. And he said, by it, you make your trade. What is this trade that he's referring to? This is a transaction with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? There's a transaction. There's a trade. There's a deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the believers make while they're in this dunya. What is the capital in which they, or with which they make this deal? One of the items is, is your time itself. Using it for Allah and giving it to Allah in exchange for what? In exchange for paradise. Allah told us that He purchased from the believers themselves and their wealth in exchange for Jannah. And by it, meaning by this time or this uh, transaction, you will reach the eternal bounties in the proximity of Allah. Every single breath of yours is a priceless jewel because it is irreplaceable, once it is gone, there is no return for it. So each of our breaths is a priceless jewel. And this particular sentence is a quote uh, from Imam al-Ghazali, and it's one of the gems of this text. Every one of your breaths is a priceless gem. Um, why? Because once it's gone, it's irreplaceable. It's more important than your wealth. It's a priceless gem, uh, and we use it, what, to draw nearer to Allah by various means. So specifically in this section, he's reminding us of how to organize our time in the context of the daily prayers. But organizing our time also applies in terms of our mundane activities, our other acts of worship, how we um, visit our family and take care of them, and so on. So the believer um, doesn't just live haphazardly. The believer organizes his or her day and night with various um, devotional works and also mundane works that are done with a good intention. And even some of that should be rest. They or we organize rest. And then if you organize your rest and you organize your worship and you rest in order to uh, invigorate yourself for worship, your rest is worship. So Sayyidina Mu'adh bin Jabal, he visited uh, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. And when they were in the Yemen, when they were out on Khuruj uh, in, in Dawah, sent out by the Messenger of Allah, and they, he asked him, you know, how do you spend your night? He said, I spend my night reciting Quran. And, uh, and Sayyidina Mu'adh, he was afqa. He was one of the most knowledgeable of the prophetic companions in the halal and the wrong. He said, he said, I stand in prayer and I also sleep. I spend some night standing in prayer and I spend some of my night resting and I anticipate from my rest the same thing I anticipate from my prayer. Meaning that if a believer, he organizes his time, he makes good intentions, he follows prophetic etiquettes. We're taught that if someone performs evolution and sleeps, their sleep is worship. And he's doing so, why? To, to get up and, and pray later and, and, and take care of business during the next day. So that's part of his service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But how do you do that? You do that by organizing your time. And, and also setting intentions that you have to draw near to Allah with that time that he's given you. So this applies to all of the prayers and it applies also uh, in general to other devotional works that we perform and mundane works as well. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak alayhi wa ala alayhi. We're going to jump up to the section specifically on the etiquette of the ritual prayer, and that is on page 68. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Um, as salah Allah said, Wa aqimu salah li dhikri. Aqimu salah li dhikri. Establish the salah for my mention, or for my remembrance. That can be understand, uh, understood 
a number of ways. It can be understood, established salah so that you remember me. So that you remember me, but it can also be established the salah so that I remember you. And salah, they say it is called salah because it's a sila, Because it's a connection or a relationship between the servant and his or her Lord. It's not just a bodily work, it's a great, great work of the heart. In this section, and we're going to go through uh, some of the, the gems of it, and we'll leave the rest to you, you'll notice that he talks about a good preparation. That is with, um, that is with the preconditions. Proper purification, proper covering of one's nakedness, facing the direction of the prayer, uh, awareness of the entrance of the time. And we mention that each of those has meanings, but they also have a physical manifestation. And uh, when we perform them physically properly, and when we perform them spiritually properly, we have the full benefit. And then he talks about um, uh, the actual obligations within the performance of the prayer. Understand that the preconditions are an obligation. right? Getting those right is an obligation. There are also obligations within the salah, such as... Um, Standing up and saying takbir, that's an obligation. Such as reciting uh, the Qur'an, preferably fatiha and some of the imams, just what's easy from the Qur'an. Such as bowing until one is still, straightening, prostrating, sitting between the two prostrations, and so on. Those are obligations, as well as those preconditions are obligations. If those are not intact, you didn't just do salah. Right, you didn't do salah. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He came and uh, someone prayed and came and spoke to him, and he went back. He said, "Go back and pray. You didn't pray. You didn't pray. You got to get those that portion right." Um, and that, with respect to salah, is like a body with respect to a living creature. And the Imam mentions that in some of his other works, that salah has a body and salah has a spirit. Right. So those physical. Obligations of salah are like the body. If, for instance, you were going to make an offering to a king, you were going to gift, make a gift to a king, maybe you gifted the king a horse, an Arabian stallion, a steed, you know, and then you bring him a horse that has three legs. You bring him a horse that has two legs. That's like a salah that doesn't have those obligatory elements. But salah has a spirit. It has a soul. You're a body and a soul. Living creatures, they have life. What is the life of prayer? The life of prayer is in the sincere intention and your presence with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'll tell you, if you have a beautiful steed, you know, it's well-groomed, its mane is combed, has a beautiful saddle blanket and, 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 and saddle and everything, you drive it up to the, to the palace and it's dead in the back of the cattle, the cattle truck. That's like a salah where you didn't think about Allah during it. You weren't present with Allah from beginning to end. It's like you gifted him a dead horse. Tayyib, then what about the sunnah that we add? The sunnahs that we add? We say, Subhana Rabbi al Azim wa bihamdi, for instance, when we're bowing. We say, Subhana Rabbi al Ala, when we're in prostration. Those are like uh, the eyes and the ears of the creature. Right? So, Tayyib, you brought him a living horse. Uh, it's not dead. You know, there's some presence. It's blind. That's like a salah in which you didn't do the invocations the Prophet ﷺ established uh, for you. Or actually we say it's without eyes. Its eyes are gadged out. And then presence in those invocations is like the faculty of sight. So the salah is not complete without all of these elements being complete. And, and there's a, if you study Islamic spirituality in the university, Allah help you, first of all. Allah help you, Allah have mercy on you, and Allah protect your faith. Because that's not an environment where faith is, is easily preserved. But one of the uh, fallacies that you will be confronted with is that the, the disciplines of Islamic spirituality are antithetical or in contradiction to the law. And that doesn't appear in our, in our books of spirituality when they're taught properly. Um, and Imam al-Ghazali is a perfect example. So um, when we study about Islamic spirituality and morals and character, we must understand, um, and Imam al-Ghazali, and inshallah, Sheikh Yahya mentioned this, he mentions it in the introduction, that the outward and the inward are absolutely connected and inseparable. And that you will not reach the inward 
and you will not reach the end of a spiritual journey without first establishing the outward properly and properly applying the, the guidance at the beginning. So in this section, and we're not going to go through it, but basically, Imam al-Ghazali, and you could read it on, in your own time, he gives you a detailed elucidation of, um, of how you perform the ritual prayer properly outwardly. And um, what do you need to uh, do that well? You need a fiqh class. Everyone should have a class in fiqh. You know, we, uh, we, do, we learn how to drive. We have driver's training. We take a little written test. We can answer questions. Tayyib our salah deserves at least that much. Um, we got, you got to study, uh, you got to study a, a text in fiqh. One has to study a text in fiqh. And what are you doing there? You're just getting the body of the horse. You're getting the body of the horse, uh, maybe its eyes, what have you. Uh, here in the text of spirituality, they go and give you its life, its soul, and also its faculties of hearing and sight and so on. And we're going to uh, study a couple of those gems uh, specifically uh, that the imam gives us in this uh, section. So he says on page 68, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak alayhi wa ala When you have finished purifying yourself and purifying your body, clothes, and surroundings of any impurities, and after you have covered your nakedness from your navel to the knees, um, this is speaking in the context of a man. In the context of a lady, everything excluding her hands and face. That is how you cover yourself uh, for the prayer. A man must cover at least what's between his navel and knees. Generally, we don't see people like that, except perhaps on Hajj or certain places where people don't have a lot of clothing. Um, and a lady covers everything, excluding her hands and face, with a difference of opinion with some of the jurists, allowing the feet to be exposed as well. Some of them saying the feet must be covered. Um, La ilaha illallah. He said, face the Qibla, standing with your feet apart, not touching uh, each other. Stand up straight and recite Surah An-Nas, seeking protection with it from Satan the accursed. So here in this section, he's going to give us a couple more keys. We gave you one key to presence, which is what? Presence in uh, your ablution. This is another um, aid in presence. It is reciting Surah An-Nas prior to beginning the prayer. Um, for the obvious reason that it's a pre protection from the shaitan that whispers and will whisper into uh, our prayer and distract us during our prayer. And that's a practical benefit you can take uh, from Imam al-Ghazali here. Uh, before standing up to prepare um, yourself to pray, recite Surah Nas. Um, and you'll find, inshallah, that Allah protects you a little bit from the, the evil of al-Khannas. Al-Khannas al-Waswas, the whisperer, and Allah protect us from him. La ilaha illallah, seeking protection with it from the shaitan, the accursed. Make your heart present and empty yourself of other thoughts. Make your heart present and empty yourself of other thoughts. How do you do that? How do you do that? Um, there's a, a longer answer and a shorter answer. The longer answer is detach your heart from everything else and attach it only to Allah. <laughs> that's the long answer. And that entails strong faith. So Imam al-Ghazali says in Ihya, he says, so quickly rush to strengthen your faith. Because as long as you have attachment to other things, your heart is going to try and wander. Um, that's the cause of it. Um, however, he'll give us uh, some, uh, a step stool that helps us get closer to that. Make your heart present and empty yourself uh, from other thoughts. Consider before whom you are standing and upon whom you are calling. You should be ashamed to enter into intimate discourse with your master, with the Lord, with a heart that is heedless and a breast full of thoughts of this world and the dross of lowly desires. The Imam Zain al-Abidin, great-grandson of the Prophet uh, the son of Hussein, Ali ibn Hussein, Zain al-Abidin, when he would make ablution, um, he would become pale. He'd become pale and they'd ask him, What's wrong? And he said, do you know the one before whom I'm going to stand and the one with whom I'm going to commune? Or the one uh, whom I'm going to address? So a key in presence is calling to heart the magnificence uh, of the one whom one addresses in that salah. He goes on, know that Allah Most High is observing your inner self and beholding your heart. Right? That is another great key. That is another great key to being present with Allah, remembering Allah's presence with you. You want to think about Allah, remember Allah's observation of you, that His sight perceives your outward just as well as He perceives your inward. 
right? So you wouldn't, with your body, you wouldn't stand and grab some wine, God forbid, and drink it. You wouldn't uh, steal. You wouldn't do some gross uh, transgression of his limits with your body because you know Allah is watching you. But Allah sees your heart just as well as he sees your body. Remember that Allah is watching you and the place that he watches most closely is the heart. The Prophet ﷺ said that. Verily, Allah does not look to your bodies or forms, but rather he looks to your hearts. Remembering that Allah is watching your heart, that helps your heart focus on Allah. Whether that happens to be in prayer or whether that happens to be anywhere else. So if you're going to sit and do dhikr, remember Allah is watching your heart. If you're going to recite Quran, remember Allah is watching your heart. When you're fasting through the day, remember Allah is watching your heart. When you give charity, remember that. Anytime you want to increase your presence, call to heart that feeling. Um, and ideally, that feeling becomes your dominant condition. Right? You did it five times during the day in salah. You did it when you sat and did dhikr three, four, five times a day. All of these intervals, these increments in your lifespan, you come back to presence with your Lord. Ideally, presence becomes your enduring uh, condition. And you're always present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do you increase your presence? You just keep working at it. Every time you wander, you bring yourself back. What is an aid? What is a rope to tug yourself back? Because it's going to tug unless you're one of those blessed people like Sa'ad bin Wa'ad. Uh, it's going it's to tug. Tug it back by recalling that Allah is watching you. And Allah is watching your heart. And that will help you have more presence. As for Sa'ad bin Mu'ad radiallahu anhu, he said, since the day I embraced Islam, I never thought about anything other than Salah when I was in Salah. That's the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, who's like them. But, and maybe some of you are like that. There's 40 of us here. There might be someone who's like that. If you're like that, please pray for me. Please pray for me in your Salah. Uh, and, uh, and those are the barakah of, uh, of the earth. Most of us, we have to work at it, but when you keep working at it, um, and that's one of the benefits of these exercises that we perform, they help reorient us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La ilaha illallah. He continues, Truly Allah Almighty accepts your prayer based only on the degree of your awe, humility, surrender, and submissive entreaty. He means submissively pleading with Allah. Right? Allah accepts uh, our prayer in accordance to um, these inward meanings, which are the life of the prayer. La ilaha illallah. Worship him, as if uh, worship him in your prayer as if you see him. And then the Prophet ﷺ gave us uh, this step stool to worshiping him uh, as if we see him. He said, for if you see him not, he nevertheless sees you. Which is what Imam Ghazali reminded us. The Prophet ﷺ reminded us of that in the Gabriel hadith. Worship Allah as though you see him. If you see him, he nevertheless, if you see him not, he nevertheless sees you. Remember that Allah is watching you and that will help you uh, be closer and more aware of him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. La ilaha illallah. And then he gives us another aid. He gives us another aid. He said, if your heart does not come to presence, this is due to a shortcoming in your knowledge of God. He says gnosis, but that's what he means, your knowledge of God. Uh, or knowledge, your knowledge, excuse me, of the magnificence of Allah. Your knowledge of Allah's magnificence is what he's uh, mentioning when he says gnosis of the magnificence of Allah, most high. Therefore, imagine that a pious man from among the respected people of your community is watching to see how your prayer is. At this, your heart will become present and your limbs peaceful. So um, he gave us a metaphor. And the Prophet ﷺ taught this uh, to one of his companions. A metaphor for uh, how we should be present in the salah. And he said, imagine if you were praying in the presence of a pious man from among your tribe. And there were tribal society that was significant. For us, we might say our family. Pious man from your family or pious woman from your family your grandmother, for instance, uh, or someone you revere, the imam, your sheikh, you were praying uh, and they were watching you, that would increase your reverence. You'd be aware that you're being watched. And this is something important. And you should do it uh, with focus. And you should do it with um, a still posture and a reverent posture. Um, that helps us be more still before Allah. However, Imam Ghazali, he said, you, we should be ashamed if this is how we are. Right? That we're not, we don't suffice ourselves with Allah's observation, and we're more still when we're being observed by one of His creatures. So that's, uh, it's like a step stool. It's like a step stool, but we shouldn't suffice ourselves with that. Uh, we should try to ascend uh, and be just as uh, awestruck or still, or perhaps more when we're alone with Allah in our Qiyam Layl than we are uh, before any of His creation. But again, this is a means. So He gave us a few means, uh, and along with, um, along with uh, what we mentioned, La ilaha illallah, 
we'll, um, we'll uh, briefly list them uh, prior to concluding this section. So one of the means of presence he mentioned in um, the last lesson, and that is presence with Allah while we're performing ablution. That's a strong means to being present in the prayer. Second, reciting Surah An-Nas when you stand up to pray for the obvious reason that uh, you know, the devils, um, the demons uh, you know, menace us and whisper to us when we're praying and that's a protection from Allah. Um, third, remembering Allah's observation of your heart. And then four, Imagine that you're praying before one of the pious of the ummah who you revere. Like a family member, a sheikh, an imam, and so on. Um, so those are means. And then there's a fifth that we'll just give uh, that's mentioned by the ulama. You just continue striving uh, to work at it. Mujahada. Every time your uh, heart wanders, you bring it back. Throughout the salah, throughout the day, what have you. And those are means uh, that increase our presence. And the one may begin, someone may begin having, very, uh, having a hard time being present in their worship and end in a state where they have a hard, hard time being present with the creation. Uh, Imam Haddad, towards the end of his life, he said, you know, don't uh, talk to me a lot because I have to work at being with you. I have to work at being present with you. Otherwise, he was preoccupied by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La ilaha illallah. And many of the pious uh, became like that in their salah. Some of them, we mentioned Ali Zain al Abidin. He was making salah in the masjid of al Madina, um, and a portion of it uh, caught fire. And the people from the market came to put out the fire, and then he said, Salaam alaykum wa rahmatullah, Salaam alaykum wa rahmatullah. They were all gathered around. He said, what, what are you all doing? He said, there's a fire. You didn't know? He said, I didn't know. I was in salah. Some of them, uh, he had to have his leg amputated. They wanted to give him some alcohol, knock him out, and cut off his leg. He said, I don't want to take anything that will remove my intellect. My intellect is a gift from Allah. My mind is a gift from Allah. Why am I going to remove my mind? I'm not going to be out of my mind. But I have a state that if, you, uh, if, you, if I enter that state, you can perform the operation and I won't feel it. So he said, when I prostrate, I'll stick out my leg and you go ahead and cut it off uh, and do the amputation. So he did that and they amputated the portion of his leg that they needed to. And he finished his salah and that was that. And, um, and there's some of those lows like that. How do they get like that? They get like that by applying the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and working with uh, techniques such as these. And this prayer is a gift. It's a gift and a connection. It's the mi'raj of the believer. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ascended to a state of presence with Allah that no other creature has in the dunya. And this salah was gifted in that uh, presence to him and his ummah. And he brought it back to us. And it's a means by which we can ascend. And a means by which we commune with Allah. A means by which we have an audience with Allah. And we actually uh, commemorate that audience that he had with Allah in our tashahud. He, when he greeted Allah on the night of Isra' al-Mi'raj, he said, At-tahiyyatul mubarakatul salawatul tayyibatul lillah. Salutations to Allah. Allah greeted the Prophet Muhammad. He said, As-salamu alayka, ayyuhan nabiyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you, O Prophet, and Allah's mercy and his blessings. And then he made dua for all of us, inshallah. All of us and all of the angels. He said, As-salamu alayna wa ala ibadillahi salihin. Peace be upon all of us who are present and all of Allah's pious servants. The angels uh, perceived they were allowed to have some witnessing of this uh, celestial meeting. Um, and they thanked Allah after having uh, been included in that prayer. And they said, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So we do that each time we pray. It's a mi'raj of the believer, but we have to work at it. We have to work at it. Uh, and um, these are some techniques for presence. And then we will just uh, conclude with this parting advice of the Imam. And this is on the, the section in the end of the prayer, La ilaha illallah, which is uh, on page 76. And he said, this is the method of the prayer for the one performing it, if he's alone. And then he mentions later in congregation. So observe the method that he describes. Some of it is fiqh uh, and some of it is spirituality. All of it's beneficial, inshallah, and we can take it and apply these lessons. And he says, the pillar of the prayer or excuse me, the pillars of the prayer. What are the pillars of the salah? They are humility. Humility, or you could say submissiveness, surrender to Allah, and presence of heart. Together with the recitation of the Quran and the remembrance of Allah with comprehension. 
So those are its pillars. Hassan al-Basri said, he's one of the second generation of the Ummah, took from many Sahaba radiallahu anhu, uh, every prayer in which the heart is not present, is not present, is more likely to, to receive punishment than reward. Every prayer in which the heart is not present, it is more likely to receive punishment than reward. However, Allah is forgiving. We're not here for his forgiveness. We deserve punishment, but he's forgiving and we hope. We hope that he accepts us as we are. And Allah's Messenger said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Verily the, the, the slave of Allah performs the prayer, and not even a sixth or a tenth of it is recorded for him. Verily only as much of a slave's prayer as he is conscious of is recorded for him, understood or her, and that is narrated by Abu Dawood. So may Allah increase us in presence and enable us to worship him well. Allahumma a'inna ala dhikrika wa shukrika. وحسن عبادتك في خير ولطف وعافية أو الله enable us aid us give us the ability and help us to remember you thank you and worship you well we ask you that by your mercy and you are the most merciful of the merciful وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين and with that we'll close and shalla there'll be another opportunity uh, to ask questions but um, honestly uh, our shiuk taught us one thing. Uh, they said, Al-amal bil-ilm yurithu halan yughni an sharh Acting on knowledge bequeaths a state that alleviates one from need for commentary. So um, everything we said and much, much more uh, is included in just taking these advices of this great imam that are from the book and the sunnah uh, themselves and acting upon them. And if Allah enables us to do that, uh, you become the explanation. Uh, and you can take that and uh, explain that to others. Through the example you set. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik ashara wa dahi da anta astag firuka wa tubu deka. Half a minute. All right, so we have a 10 minute break, inshallah. A stretch break. If you want to go grab something to drink outside of the, the, uh, outside of the prayer hall. Uh, and then we'll, we'll be back in 10 minutes with Sheikh Amin. Uh, he'll be discussing uh, sins of the tongue.